Welcome to presentation 7 in our series where we're looking at the letter that Paul wrote to the followers of Jesus in Ephesus. Just reflecting back, in the last presentation we saw this wonderful insight that Paul gives us. The life of Jesus is expressed through us, ordinary people, through us, you and me, as we identify with him and allow his spirit to work within us. We come into his kingdom, the process of transformation by his spirit starts and the life of Jesus shines through us. This reflects back right to the teaching in Matthew's gospel about us being light and hope in the world. But we're living in a culture a society, and it operates on different principles. The followers of Jesus in Ephesus lived in a society where things were unsympathetic. So in first century Ephesus, there was emperor worship. Artemis worship, Diana, god of the Ephesians. And that brought with it sexual excesses that were often linked into temple practices. And there was the widespread use of the occult to manipulate and control people and things in ways that are not healthy. How were they to survive and live the life of Jesus in that kind of context that was unsympathetic, that would seek to destroy them? What about today? We're living in a world in the West which is dominated by materialism and the love of enjoyment. We live for enjoyment where power is seen as a god and it manifests itself in many ways where sexual excesses and sexual deviations are becoming an acceptable norm in society very much parallel to what was happening in first century Ephesus and where tragically substance abuse is widespread where lives are being damaged, homes are being broken up children are being hurt how do the followers of Jesus express the life of Jesus in a culture that's unsympathetic like that. So many today, as it was in Ephesus, were living with self-interest at the centre. For what life could give them? The top agenda was themselves. Paul's quite blunt, it's called idolatry. And the net outcome is we end up devaluing others by what we say and what we do. And you can see exactly the same today. People aren't discussing ideas, disagreeing about ideas. They're devaluing others by their use of language. So people are being called bigots. Their motives are being challenged. Their integrity is being undermined. And actions are being taken where we hurt each other. Well, if that happens within the community of God's people, if that infiltrates into our little local communities, we lose the richness of our inheritance in Jesus. That's the problem that Paul's addressing. The wonder that he's pictured in the early chapters of all that Jesus has done for us. But we're living. We're living in a hostile culture. But how do we live in that culture? We're not opting out. We're part of it. But how do we live in that culture as his people, a community? He's not talking to individuals, but a community. But don't become contaminated by that culture. <clears throat> it's very easy to become contaminated by the culture all around. Very difficult to resist. We're kind of seduced. And we start to use words and think things and do things that reflect the societal norms round about us. And the pressures that come from society conform, conform, conform. And you can see that today. The pressures that are coming upon the organised church to conform to the standards that society has set and it keeps changing them. But Paul is very positive in all of this. <clears throat> he pictured us adopted into the kingdom. When we come into the kingdom, when we take the decision, we want to go the way of Jesus, we're welcomed in. God takes us as his children. That's radical thought. And in the kingdom, we're called to live lives reflecting Jesus. That means our agenda 
is always to seek the best for the other. No matter who the other is, whether they deserve it or not, what they've done to us, or whether they can return anything. That's our agenda within our communities, but also in wider society. It gives us a framework, a guiding star, a direction. God is love. We're called to reflect that love, the way of Jesus to the wider world. With that background in mind, because this is linked very tightly in to the previous presentation, Paul goes on, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which lead to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another to reverence for Christ. We're living in an unsympathetic society. Paul is aware of that. He gives us a framework. Now the context of this is the social gatherings. This is not formal church life. That didn't exist in those days. The followers just got together in homes. That's where they met. Now in the culture of that day, when people met together in their homes for social gatherings, the, the meetings were often built on the excess of use of alcohol. Now these people had come out of that background Coming to Jesus was actually radically new to them. This was the only model they had. No, that's not the way. That's not the way. You don't need to do that. The Holy Spirit can direct a better way. A way that's positive. Where gratitude to God is central. Where Jesus is King. Where from the depth of our being we're expressing our gratitude to Him. That's the picture Paul has got. We've interpreted this with a messed Western mindset. It doesn't help us. This is not a formal church gathering. They didn't exist. That came centuries later. So Paul says that. In your social gatherings, as the followers of Jesus met together to support each other, encourage each other, build each other up, that's the picture Paul has given us in this letter. That we know from history is a pattern that did happen. You don't have to rely on substance abuse for enjoyment and satisfaction. You're breaking away to a new kind of way of thinking, a different kind of cultural expression, a different kind of community life. That was tough for these early Christians in Ephesus because they'd come out of that background. And you can center it all on what God has done for us in Jesus. Paul's pictured that in the early chapters, the wonder of it. And that can lead you to peace, fulfillment, security, satisfaction, and far, far more. It's wonderful. We focus away on enjoyment, satisfying what we want. We focus it on God and what he's done for us in Jesus. And how we can help each other to live positively, wholesomely, radiantly living the Jesus way in a society that was unsympathetic. That's the picture Paul has in mind, the social gatherings in each other's homes, which would be the pattern of the society of the day. Then we come to this verse. It'll read something like that in your Bible. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, it may surprise you that in the original it's not a command. That's what it says. Submitting to one another in reverence for Christ. Now, you notice that there are dots before it because it continues on from the sentence and it leads on to the sentence of the next section. One of the tragedies is our Bible has broken things up into paragraphs and sections. It's impossible to, to translate this into meaningful English. It's a description, not a command. It's expression of a way of life. 
There's no top dog in these little communities of the followers of Jesus in Ephesus. There's no ruler. There's no, no person ordering them around and directing them. This is the kind of way of pagan religion. It's the kind of way of the society that was the Roman society of the day. As we'll see in a moment, Paul works it through. No Paul is saying, underpinning everything in your relationships with each other, in every aspect of living, this is an expression of a way of life. Now, what does Paul mean by that? Because it's submitting and it links the last sentence to the next sentence. In fact, they're all one sentence. But it raises a very big question for us today. Logically, with Western mindsets, how can I submit to someone else who at the same time is submitting to me? There's an illogicality. Submitting to one another in reverence for Christ. That's what it says. Even if you'd put it into the command format, which translators this have to do to make any sense of it. How can we do that? Now the problem here is this. We are looking at this to the lens of modern day thought forms. Paul wrote this in the first century. He wrote it in a Roman cultural setting. He wrote it to followers of Jesus gathering together in quite significant numbers in homes in the Ephesus area. How do you live the way of Jesus in a society which is unsympathetic? But if we look at it through a Western mindset, it leads to incorrect understandings. Our culture is different. We think differently. And indeed the very word submitting carries a different kind of meaning in our Western thought forms compared to what it would carry in the culture that was Roman culture. So let's see if we can unpack this a little bit and make sense of it. Let's look at the idea of submission. What is the meaning of this word? How would these original hearers have got it in the first century in Ephesus? That's what the word speaks about. An ordered stability of organization and the relationships. You see, in our society today, we've got a hierarchical system. That's our mental mindset. That's the way things are ordered. That's the stability our society gets. That wasn't the way in the days of the Roman Empire. So the word would be understood in a different way. And if you look at the New Testament as a whole, the word is used in a number of places and it refers to the way the physical universe works an ordered stability of organization and relationships. It describes the way the spiritual universe works an ordered stability of organization and relationships. It relates to the way family life works and we'll look at that in a moment an ordered stability of organization and relationships. And it relates to the way society in general works, Roman society, an ordered stability of organization and relationships. And it was run differently in those days compared to today. So we've got to interpret this in the context and the way the original hearers would have got it. Fundamentally, that's the question that Paul is addressing. How does the way of Jesus relate to social structures? That's a fundamental question for us today. And I'm hoping this presentation will give us pointers that will help us forward. How do you live for Jesus in a society which is unsympathetic and where things are demanded of you that contradict the way of Jesus? How do we react to that? Now, if you look at the way Christian people today in the West are handling some of the issues, we're facing these problems. Sometimes we handle them well, very often we don't. We need to go back and read what Paul says about it and get the principles right. Let's look at the broad biblical picture. The word submission is used in relation to God the Father and Jesus the Son. You see, we're thinking about hierarchical. That's not the way it was understood at the time. That's not the way the word would be understood in the culture that was there, the Roman culture. 
It's an ordered way of organizing things. It's stability. We understand the Trinity in a relationship. Submission of the entire physical and spiritual universe. Jesus made it. It's his universe. It's God's universe. And when it runs the way it was intended to run, the way it was designed, both physically and spiritually, then we've got an ordered system that works. Same with ourselves. Jesus brought us into being because of his life, death and resurrection. We only exist because of Jesus. We're committed to following his way, living for him by his power in the Spirit. When we live that way, that's the ordered stability that generates when we live it the way he intended it and planned it. But the word is also used in relation to secular authorities who are in the business of giving the order stability to society. So we have to conform to that wherever possible. The spiritual leadership within our little communities of the followers of Jesus. They are there to give us the ordered stability, not to order us around. It's not hierarchical. That's not the way the word will be understood. And of course, we live our lives in communities. And when we live them the way of Jesus, then we're reflecting God and his way of righteousness. That's the order of stability that God's planned for us. But Paul's looking at practical things like, how does it work out in the home? How does it work out in society which was dominated by slavery? How does it work out in relationship between children and parents? And we have to interpret it in the way that these things happened in the society of the day and see the picture that Paul is painting as to how Jesus wants it to work out for us. Then we have to interpret that into our culture today. We have a problem. In Western society, we value these words. We want freedom. Now, very often freedom has become license. We want equality. We want value. But within the Christian communities, we believe in freedom. Freedom in Christ. We're all equal. And before God, we all have value. Now, this group in Ephesus had emerged, scattered throughout the city. Groups were meeting in homes. Followers of Jesus, they were born out of a pagan society. Some came from a Jewish background that gave them the advantage, but most did not. How do these groups relate to wider society? How did Rome get its social stability? A hierarchical organization of society, but not the hierarchical organization of today. There were clear fixed relationships. And they ran across the whole of the social order. People were seen to have obligations and responsibilities. But it was based on that. The stronger ruling the weaker that underpinned the Roman society. Might was right. And power and wealth brought superiority. It's a very different kind of society from the society today. There were those who ran things and those who served them. The masters, the slaves. The husbands, the wives. The children were definitely the have-nots. That's very different from Western society today, where we have deep hierarchical structures built in. If you look at the way today is Western social stability, this is incomplete perhaps, but we might describe it as that. Individualism was very strong. Now that didn't exist in the days of the Roman Empire. Community was very strong. If you've got skills and abilities, oh, you're highly elevated. So we put education on a pedestal. Sporting prowess, musical ability. 
we have ruling classes people who by their education background and just in the families they were born into see themselves as a right to rule that did exist in Roman days our society today we put pressure we have people of obligations but sometimes we don't take our responsibilities so we develop a blame culture so when something goes wrong and criminals do something we blame the police when people don't get well quick enough we blame the doctors and when anything in society goes wrong well blame the teachers where are our obligations and that still is present in Western society. The have-nots are where they are because of some weakness in them. But a bit like Rome, might is right, wealth brings power. And the wealth of the West is accumulated itself in a dreadful way into the hands of tiny minorities some of whom own more wealth than several states put together that's our western social stability it's not a complete picture and it will vary from country to country how do we survive as the followers of Jesus in that the Roman world and modern societies the way of Jesus it's caught in between and the trouble is we come to the book of Ephesians and we interpret the way of Jesus that Paul pictures with our modern societies forgetting that he's comparing it to the Roman world so we've got to understand it the way there is no hearers would understand it you see there are clear structural hierarchies not the hierarchies that we've got today there's clear role definition in those days and some people were seen as having almost no value. We think in terms of individualism, not the community stability of the Roman world. Personal freedoms, but we apply these inconsistently. So there's freedom for one group to say anything they like about another group, but if the other group says something, then they're hammered in the courts, so they lose their jobs or they're vilified. So there's a hierarchy of those freedoms. One group trumps another. The way of Jesus, we are all of equal value before God. That's in neither the Roman world nor in modern societies. But Paul's comparing to the Roman world. But we differ widely in roles and functions in society, including Christian society. Now these are very sweeping pictures, but they do give us a picture of the problem. How do we survive as the followers of Jesus in a society which is unsympathetic? And we've got to remember that our status and our function, the two are not the same. Our spiritual status and our social function. In the way of Jesus, our spiritual status is we are all equal and of equal value. He died for each one of us. But our social function in wider society or within the Christian group, that can vary. You see, we were all called equally in love. It's the same Holy Spirit given to every single follower of Jesus and he's there to enable us to live for Jesus. There's no social sliding scale of human worth. That's our spiritual status. We're all of equal value, but we differ in skills, abilities, and functions. Paul has described a lot of that in the functions that need to be fulfilled within the Christian community of Ephesus. And we can still reflect 
societal patterns. We can live in this society. We don't have to opt out and maintain these principles. And Paul is teasing out, how do we work this through? And this is a fundamental issue that we've got to address in the 21st century, which where the church in the West, we've got things quite a bit wrong. And we've got to address that issue. Paul looks at it in a number of areas. He's very touched upon this. In the church, there is no central control. There's no one person seeking to control or rule others. It's always in the plural. We're all together in it, committed to Jesus. Jesus loves every single one. He's speaking about the church as the local gathering of the people of Jesus. Yes, but we need ordered stability. We're back to submission. We need ordered stability in our little local groups of the followers of Jesus. Leadership is always shared. The, the New Testament never speaks about one man leadership or one person leadership. The gifts of the Spirit equip us so that key tasks can be carried out and Paul has described them in chapter 4. So that the church will move forward and grow and develop and become more like Jesus. Now he looks at the husband-wife relationship. And he pictures us transformed into partnership of equals, each living for the benefit of the other. We'll look at that in a moment. Children, and we'll see how children were treated in a moment or two. He speaks of children being respected and their development and interests supported. The Roman Emperor was built on slavery. Paul couldn't demolish slavery. He totally undermines it. But he couldn't destroy it. This was the way society had been built. It was wrong. But within the community of the followers of Jesus, there were people who were slaves. And there were people who were their masters. Maybe the same masters and slaves were in the same group. They were now equals. How did that work out in the slavery master situation? You see, the word transform keeps coming in. And that's what Jesus is in the business of doing. Transformation. Now that's helped us, I hope, to see something of it through the mindset that was the Roman Empire of the day. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to the husbands in everything. Husband, love your wife, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does for the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now we'll read the second part in a moment or two. Just a few points on this one. Remember, in the original it's not a command. It's a description. In the original, the word submit isn't even there because it's all one sentence. Submitting to one another reverence for Christ, wives to your own husbands. That's what it says. We've westernized it and we've interpreted the word submit in a western way. That's not the way the word would have been understood. And this passage has caused endless problems and still does today, especially when you read an old version of the Bible, an old translation, which doesn't help. That is a command. The word is there. But remember, the word means that our agenda is the best. For the other. It's a word devoid of emotional content. 
it's a word of action that's what Paul's saying you see we've got the word submit in a western thought form we want to live for Jesus in the ordinary ordered stability that he offers the husband want the wife wants to live for her husband in the ordered stability of the the marriage relationship that's what Paul's saying puts a different slant in it and the end brings it together husband and wife are living for each other now love means sacrifice what a positive and beautiful picture don't know if you notice the number of times the word love occurs it means our agenda is the best for the other Jesus loved the church now the word church doesn't mean an organization doesn't mean a building it means the gathered community of his followers in a locality that's what the word means and the agenda of Jesus is the best for you and me in that context he lived and he died and he rose again that's action not emotion there's nothing emotional about the cross death by public torture that's love the best for the other there's a model there that underpins it all I say we come to the second part then we'll look at it all together children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise so it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth fathers do not exasperate your children instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord not people because you know the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do whether they are slave or free and masters treat your slaves in the same way do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him this is radical thinking about the way children are to be treated and it runs contrary to the way of society of that time and there's no use translating slaves masters in terms of the workplace of today there is no comparison it's not a valid comparison at all slaves were property they had no rights they were bought and sold masters could do anything to them they wished and they had no right of redress and Rome and the empire was built on slavery it's estimated that maybe even 30 percent of the population of the capital city were slaves perhaps 10 percent over the whole empire but within the community people gathering in each other's homes meeting together to support each other in the way of Jesus that's what church means there'd be those who were slaves and there were those who were their masters they were now equal in the eyes of Jesus how does that work out in a culture and society where slavery is a norm you can't just get rid of it the church would have been annihilated if it had tried but it comes in pairs obey do not exasperate it's two way obey treat your slaves in the same way there are responsibilities and obligations both ways something that our modern society has lost a bit that's the picture and that's radically different from the culture of Ephesus in the first century 
Paul doesn't command wives to submit to their husbands. There are no imperative verbs. It's a description. But he doesn't command husbands to submit to their wives. If he did that, he'd be running against everything that society was in the culture of the day. Not realistic, which is why he switches the word to love and uses a specific word, meaning that the husband's agenda is the best for his wife. You see, it's mutual submitting. We forget the opening sentence, submitting to each other. A description of the way of Jesus working out in relationships. That's a command. And that was radically different from what went on, at least in many homes at the time. And he uses the picture of Jesus loving the church as his model, illustrating it. Jesus gave everything to bring into being the people of God, the you and me. That's the model for husbands. And that's a very tall order. That's a very high standard. We get confused about these words. We think authority and submission are opposites. You see, in our society, in the society of Rome at the time, they were seen as opposites. If you were in authority, others submitted to you. Your boot was on their neck. And we have that a bit today. Now look at this. This is radically different. Jesus retained his authority even as he washed the feet of his disciples. Jesus retained his authority even as stripped naked he was tortured to death publicly on a cross. That's a radically different way of looking at things. And it influences and must influence our relationships within the communities of God's people today. And we also get confused about the words head and body. Think of it this way. The head is seen as the source and direction to enable the body to function. But it also seeks the best for the body. You can see why Paul does the comparison between marriage relationship and the Jesus church relationship. Because the same principle applies. Jesus is the source and direction of the people of God. He enables us to function. We are his body. We express in our lives his nature to the wider world around. But Jesus seeks the best for his people, for you and me, all the time. That's the picture in marriage. If you're like the man, is the source and direction to enable the wife to function, but seeks the best for the wife. Now let's work that through into modern culture a bit. You see, love always brings freedom. God loved humanity and he gave us the freedom to choose. Love always takes risks. We're not talking about emotional love. We're talking about love seeking the best for the other. How about that? The husband gives liberty to his wife to be her own person. That's the source and direction to enable the body to function in a marriage relationship. Equally, being her own person is to be found in the release she has in being identified fully with her husband. You can see why the model of the church is a model of marriage and why Paul was stumbling over the language there, using one as an illustration of the other. There are parallelisms. Now, there are very, very deep thoughts here. And Paul makes that point that this is very deep. We've got to work this through, ponder this through. We've got in our groups to discuss it through and work it out in practice. In our church groups, 
and in marriage relationships. That's God's model, God's picture. That's the way of Jesus. It's radical. It's different. But it's not the legalism that so often we've taken from this passage and then imposed on people today. We've got to understand it the way the language was used. We've got to understand it in the way the people who heard it originally would have understood it and then interpret it into modern society. Let's remind ourselves that submission is a description, ordering your life in relationship to the other. Comes back to identity. The followers of Jesus, we in our local communities, in our society, in our cultures, are the representatives and expression of Jesus before the world around. Jesus works through us. He's the head of the body. But Jesus honours and empowers his followers for this task. That's the picture for the local church, the picture that Paul is driving at. And it's paralleled by the marriage relationship. The wife devotes herself to representing and expressing her husband before wider society, while the husband honours and elevates his wife before the wider society. That's the picture Paul is bringing to us. And that's the picture we've got to get back into the central of teaching within our communities as young people today enter into marriage. Moving to children. That's how Roman society saw it. And in general, children were of little social worth, and indeed, non-Roman children could be exploited for work or whatever. Yes, parents did see the responsibilities and they tended to love their children. That's natural, real and wonderful. And indeed, adult children did look after their aged parents. There was no welfare state. That often happened. But mortality was high. And that's staggering. We're not talking about a culture that's the same as today. Just to survive, children had to work. There was no education for most children. And slave children, they were often just treated as the children of the owner, his possessions. And the idea of being adopted into God's family, having equal rights of inheritance, imagine the effect of that teaching, that biblical teaching, for somebody who'd been brought up as a slave child. And slave children could be exploited in any way you liked, including sexual pleasure. They were possessions. They were inferior. That's the culture of the day. Now Paul is building things around unity. In one of his earliest letters, this letter we're looking at is one of his latest ones, in one of his earliest ones, he says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. You're adopted into God's family. You've responded to God, which is what faith means. For all of you were baptized into Christ. We've identified with Jesus. Clothe ourselves with Christ. We are his representatives, expression in the world. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Total equality, total unity, total togetherness. But God, remember that. Real unity isn't based on social, cultural, ethnic unity. It's unity because of Jesus and is found at the cross. And tragically, some of our Christian gatherings and some of our churches today merely reflect the social mix of that community. And the unity is because people are of a similar social background. That's not real unity. The church involves the diversity of everybody. 
and the radical problem in the days of Paul was the slave and the free. You can't remove these differences. You can't magic them away with a wave of a wand. But you can remove that. That's what Paul's driving at. And he, he undercuts the whole of the concept of slavery by that. It's wrong. But we start by removing the principle behind it, which is dominance and superiority. That some people have the right to rule and some people don't have it. Dominance and superiority. Now you see that still in the West today. And Paul is totally destroying any concept of social dominance, any kind of ruling class, any kind of patriarchy where men rule, women second-class citizens. And the church has failed miserably at that and is still doing so, where women are still being denied equal opportunities. And it completely undercuts any concept of slavery in any form. There is no dominance and superiority. That's what Paul's driving at. You see, slavery today gives favour and advantage to those with power, money and influence. And they use it to solidify their power, usually. You get rare examples of something different. Now look at Western culture. And it's influenced and infiltrated into our church life. Resources, power, status, position. They're used to solidify the power. There are those who have and there are the have-nots. Paul undercuts all of that. Bringing it together, order stability the way God intends it to be for our greatest benefit, being subject a description. We're seeking the best for the other. Order stability in relationships. And Paul has worked it out and how this principle affects our relationships within the communities of the followers of Jesus. And we've broken the principles again and again in the church in the West today. In the marriage bond, he lifts it to a new level of thinking. Where each surrenders and lives for the other. That's how we might summarize it. <clears throat> We've removed the pressures of dominance and hierarchy. We've lifted the life of children. Now the Christian church and the people of followers of Jesus down through the centuries have made massive steps forward in the way children are treated. And Paul addresses the great problem of the Roman society. Slavery has gone on down through the ages. Indeed, formal slavery was only banished in parts of the Middle East in the 1920s. But slavery still exists in practice today, where people are being enslaved and dominated by others. That's the glorious picture Paul presents. We've got to work this out and work it through, living the Jesus way in a society which is unsympathetic. That's a big agenda for the people of God in the West today. What a message from this letter that Paul has written. final part we're going to be looking like living like Jesus and the resources that God makes available to us for that task.